I know that I was born a scientist from studying physics and chemistry. So this is my passion. I had a very big research group in Cambridge. I applied for the chief scientific advisor position and I got it. Oh, so there I go into government. I went in precisely because I was concerned about climate change. David, I'd love to learn a bit about your family roots and beginnings. I was born in, in Durban, in uh, what's now called KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. And then when I was three, my parents moved to Johannesburg. So I was really brought up in Johannesburg, being born in 1939. And in the period while I was growing up, we had the development of the apartheid government in South Africa. That's right. A racist government. And um, in my childhood, I needed to understand everything. I needed to understand how the world works, how everything works. So I, I know that I was born a scientist, right? Mm. I was just querying everything. From, from that uh, position, I, was, I found myself sort of unconsciously questioning the whole r rationale of the regime I was brought up in. And, and inevitably, that means I came up against a lot of opposition. Mm. Um, Can I you talk about that opposition? Mm. What was that opposition like? I mean, it's quite uncomfortable to dwell on it um, because the, the whole, I, I was kicked out of the family home because I used to write letters to the newspaper uh, criticizing the apartheid regime. Wow. And my parents complained that their telephone was clearly being bugged, which I'm sure it was. Right, so I was kicked out of the home. I, I go to university. It was, it was all a big education going through university, and this is when I began supporting the rebel Man Nelson Mandela. Mandela had been arrested in 1962, um, and I was picked up in 1963 in the mopping up operation. Wow. Right, so he, he gets sent to Robben Island, the most frightening episode of my life was the interview on the seventh floor of the so-called Gray's Building in Johannesburg, which is where the special branch worked from. Oh, and you can remember that visually in your mind. Absolutely. Wow. So let me now tell you, why did I say seventh floor? It was already widely known and put about that people spontaneously jumped out of the window from the seventh floor of the Gray's Building. Right? And you sit down for your interview, there's an open window behind you, there's an interviewer sitting down and a very big guy behind him. So you can see the operation. They, I'm sure, let the message out that these people were spontaneously jumping out the window. It's a big threat. So yeah. it was, it's fascinating, but anyway, up to the point where it becomes terrifying. Right. So this is the point at which I start negotiating. And they're saying to me, <coughs> You, we believe you're a communist, and at this point, it was the Minister of Justice who decided if you were a communist. They changed the law. So I wow. clearly had no chance. So I, I negotiated my way out of South mm. Africa. I was told I could never return, right? So I left the country I was born and bred in and had never left up to that point. Wow. And arrived in London in 1963. Yes. I'm going to have a bite. I know, having a quick bite as well. Mm. Mm. Can you tell me a bit about the connection between the injustice that you saw in South Africa and the connections that you see in injustice within this movement that you've always been working towards? The connection for me is something called integrity, right? If, if, I, if you ask me about my scientific career, I was absolutely careful that everything I published was carefully researched, carefully worked through, and I never published anything that I wasn't very confident about. Mm. Because for a scientist to be attacked for not getting it right is quite a problem for your career. The same applies to my, if you like, moral life. You know, my integrity is my most precious possession. That's right. If a prime minister asked me not to say something in public, 
about what the science was telling me, I couldn't do it. I would resign. So tell me a bit about the integrity that you have seen from early on and how that's transformed over time to help other young people understand what they should be doing in terms of the sustainability movement or energy transition. Everyone can influence everyone else. What, what is so important here is how human beings like to imitate each other in their own circle. Right. You may be the first person in your circle to start talking about the impacts of climate change, but you carry on and you'll find you've got your circle behind you. Mm. Right. So we, we, we just need to see more of this wildfire spreading in this way. Next one, Luke. What are the positive tipping points to then maneuvering others to start disrupting their yeah. systems to create this ripple effect? Here's, here's the, the big challenge in the, in the climate change world, is the power of the giants, the fossil fuel industry, uh, particularly the oil industry, but in the United States, the coal industry, the Koch brothers. We have seen an enormous pushback from them and extremely effective. These are guys, I describe them as giants, with a vast amount of money at their disposal. And their activity in trying to disparage the science of climate change has been amazingly successful. And when I say amazingly successful, we are now in a very difficult position because countries have not done enough. And I want to say this. Which country should have led the world on this? Not Britain, it should have been the United States. The United States this year is producing more oil than any country in the world has ever produced. Instead of providing leadership, they've actually been in the opposite camp. I wonder how, you, how we can connect that to the individual lives of people, yeah, yeah, yeah. ordinary people yeah. that may not be involved in the climate space movement, but are experiencing these climate effects on the daily. So your, your point is very, very important. Everyone in the world is impacted by the, the, what's happening in climate change. There has to be a joint understanding well, that we're on a big venture. And if, if I can put this into a global cultural need, we have an economic system that has developed amazingly in terms of human well-being around the world. And it's now global. Is that the way forward? It is driven entirely by consumerism and it puts no value on ecosystems. We are actually destroying the ecosystems That's right. that provide us with our ability to survive. Exactly. We are killing ourselves in this process. So we actually need a major cultural understanding of this and a transformation. We need to move towards what is called an ecological civilization in which you give equal prominence to the well-being of your ecosystems as you give to the well-being of human beings. Mm. So it is important to recognize there are places in the world such as China mm. where this is the culture and it's been distorted by this capitalist system. We, we need to nurture this and bring it back in and ex expand it around the world. That's the way we have a future for humanity. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> These are messy. <laughs>